Welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording, the electronics reporter. So if you're a proper engineer, you'll have a drawer full of, of phone chargers and SIM cards for phones you no longer own, you know, just in case. And while we all know what a SIM card is, do we know how it works? Is it just a dumb authentication device or is there more inside? You may have also heard that physical SIM cards are being replaced by eSIMs, a SIM card in a chip soldered to the circuit board. For consumers, this is just a convenience. However, if you're building cellular IoT applications, it saves a lot of fiddling with nail-sized sims, nail sims during manufacturing. To find out more about eSIMs, iSIMs, and how secure IoT applications are deployed, my experts for this episode are Toby Grimshaw from Keegan and Jimmy Jones from Zariot. So, Toby, I'm going to add you to the stage there. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, whoops. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> there we go. Toby, sorry, good to find you at last on the screen. Too many, too many things to click. So can you tell us uh, very briefly, um, who is Keegan, what do you do, and what is your role? Uh, yeah, so I'm Toby Grimshaw. I'm based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, uh, I'm lead on iSIM, uh, Integrated SIM Business Development Solutions within the organisation. Keegan is a spin-out from ARM Technologies. Our role is around driving the advancement uh, of integrated uh, SIM technologies and eSIM technologies uh, and to be the cornerstone of innovation and particularly around security. So we're all around security and all around the driving the sort of SIM technologies forward. So, so pleased to meet everyone. Yeah, nice to be here. Lovely. So stay in the line there. We'll come back to you shortly. I'm just going to have a quick chat with Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Good to see you. So uh, you work yeah, for Zariot and you help IoT customers. Explain briefly what does Zariot do and what's your role at the organization? So Zariot are a mobile uh, virtual operator uh, providing cellular connectivity for the IoT uh, industry. Uh, we focus completely on that uh, sector. Um, our unique go-to-market is to give uh, security and flexibility. So we try to make the... Um, cellular network more accessible uh, for the overall end-to-end -end solution for IoT and one of the, the big parts of that is the flexibility that Keegan give us to be able to create our own SIM profiles and be able to tailor solutions not just to our network but to the um, IoT solution as a whole. Super, thanks very much. We'll stay there and we'll come back to you in a bit once we've had a, ch uh, a chat with uh, Toby uh, on the SIM side first, okay? So our show today is sponsored by Circuit Design GmbH, the German subsidiary of Circuit Design Inc. from Japan. They've been developing and manufacturing low power radio modules or short range devices, SRDs, for the license free European ISM frequency bands since 1974. Thanks to their low power technology and narrow band, uh, low power and narrow band technology, these high quality transmitters, receivers, transceivers, and modems are highly suited to long range battery powered applications. Typical use cases include remote controls, telemetry, alarm and security systems, and industrial applications where high reliability in wireless data transmission is essential. Now, I've dipped in and out of the topic of cellular IoT over the years, even covering its low power capabilities somewhere here ah, in the most recent edition of the Elector magazine. And if you've got that to hand, that was on page 64. Um, through that, it, it became clear how difficult it is to find even basic information on this technology. It often plays not just second fiddle, but third or fourth to smartphone focus 5G. So you've probably got just as many questions from my guests as I have. Regardless of where you're watching, join in the conversation by posting your questions and comments during the show. Simply use the chat function on YouTube and LinkedIn, or tweet us on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it today using the hashtag ElectorEI. We'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. So Toby, welcome back. 
good to, um, to have you there. So um, where I wanted to start is where most people probably understand about um, telecoms, even um, engineers probably struggle <laughs> from this point onwards. So as consumers, we all know about SIM cards for phones. So let's just start at the beginning. Is a SIM card a dumb circuit that secures, stores security information, some sort of authentication chip um, about your telecom provider and account, or, or is there more to it than that? Um, there's quite a bit more to it than just a, a sort of a dumb, <laughs> a dumb circuit So effect, effectively, what you've got in a SIM is a very secure processor. It's often referred to as a tamper-resistant uh, element or hardware, effectively, and that's that's been a standards-based secure element, it's often called, uh, that sits inside um, uh, the SIM. And then on top of your secure processor and your chip inside that, you've got the operating system, and the operating system uh, pr primarily gives a lot of functional control to things like apps and functionality on power saving. So you have an operating system. And Keegan's background is actually, uh, we were uh, originally a company called Simility set up over about 18 years ago. And they design the lowest footprint, highly modular SIM operating system. And essentially, that's one of our key propositions to market. We're actually the fifth largest SIM vendor globally that no one's ever heard of because we've, uh, we were in ARM being incubated in ARM uh, for four years. So the operating system is a key ingredient that goes on every SIM. And irrespective of your form factor, um, when I say form factor, whether it's a plastic SIM or a soldered SIM or an integrated SIM, you, diff you can have a different flavor and operating system. It's agnostic to the form factor. And then you also have operating systems, which are slight nuances and differences. So you'll have a consumer operating system for a smartphone. You'll have an, uh, uh, an M2M operating system for an IoT device, depending on the standards of remote SIM provisioning. And you'll start to hear this term of IoT OS, uh, SIM OS for the IoT standards that are coming through the new standards around remote SIM provisioning. Added to that, you've got the information from the profile of what the uh, subscription is from the um, from the provider, and then you can develop Java apps that come inside of that, which can be things like multi-IMSI to tell you which operator to switch to in which region. There's plenty more, but that's kind of giving you a flavour of what's what's inside a SIM. Now. I think even on the consumer market, you see some of the latest um, Apple handsets and some of the other um, handset providers. Uh, they're starting to integrate eSIMs. That's a, a type of SIM in a chip that is soldered onto the PCB of, of your circuit board. Are, are these chips then also pre-programmed with a user account info? Um, and if so, what happens if you change telecoms provider? Yeah, good question. So if I can just go back a couple of things, just to sort of get a level playing pitch for everybody. And, and, and I've learned this from inside out. There's a lot of acronyms that are used in, in this world, which are very com, you know, confusing sometimes. If you think of a SIM in three ways, think about it in a form factor, or in two ways, actually. And the, the form factor is either a plastic SIM or it's a soldered SIM, often called to a discrete SIM, which you're referring to, or it's actually an integrated SIM where the SIM technology is a hardware solution designed in, into the silicon itself. And then you have functionality, and functionality within the telco market is often described as UICC, which means it has the capability of connecting to a single operator profile, and it's a plastic SIM. And then you have the term EUICC, which means it then has the capability of being managed remotely. We call, have this term called remote SIM provisioning, where you can switch from one operator to the other operator. Uh, depending on the, the contracts that are in place and depending on the nature, whether it's consumer or, or M2M. And then you have a, another form factor description, which is known as IUICC, and that's describing the form factor of, of an integrated SIM, which has a single profile. And then you have a combination of IEUICC, which allows an integrated SIM to then be uh, managed through remote SIM provision. So you've kind of got this definition of form factor and um, functionality. So in your case, you're describing there is an eSIM, which is a soldered discrete SIM, and it has EUICC capability. So now that can come with a, a, a profile preloaded, a bootstrap profile, and when it connects to a network, it can then be remotely managed to another operator if it has remote SIM provisioning. Or it may be you have a discrete SIM that's been soldered in that doesn't have that functionality in it, it's UICC capability, so it has single profile. So it depends on what's underneath uh, the term eSIM effectively. 
so we've got the we've got the the, the sim e sim i sim as, as sort of describing the hardware, and then as you were saying, there's the the terminology which I was also looking at earlier. This UICC, this Universal Integrated Circuit um, Card, which sort of describes what that that piece of hardware is capable of doing, whether it's uh, can be updated remotely or not. Um, now, so, something you've mentioned then, and something I hadn't seen before before um, we started talking to you recently and preparing for the show, are these I sims, these integrated sims. Um, how how so? How are I sims different from from e sims and, and normal sims? Um, yeah, we've got a, perhaps if have you got a slide that we could throw I, up on that? Oh, so I have. Great. Let's. Uh... Perfect. Okay, that's great. So, so what what you can see in front of you here is kind of like a, a, a view of the world. So you, you can sort of see um, top left pluggable sim. That's a plastic sim, and then you have an embedded sim, often known as a discrete sim. And an embedded sim is basically a, a very much smaller format of a plastic sim. A plastic sim is a removable sim that you can take out of the device. An embedded sim is, as you described there, is soldered into a device. You can't get to it. So therefore, you need to be able to provision that remotely. And an integrated SIM actually takes that, te that form factor and the technology a stage further because it's actually designing the SIM technology as a hardware solution. So it is still a tamper resistant element designed right into the heart of the silicon. And you end up with a whole raft of, uh, of changes with that. It's basically bringing MCU, the modem, the operating system and the memory all together into one single uh, device which is very small inside the silicon so if you're a module vendor you already have the hardware capability built into that when you take that module in and then when you're in a, a, a device maker you're receiving it with the sim technology already inbuilt Resi resilience is increased uh, you have a much smaller uh, bill of materials because it is a much smaller item you don't have to se secure a separate logistically a, a, a discrete sim to solder on something so you're removing uh, those elements of it there's elements around power and performance which we can sort of expand on uh which you get efficiencies we're using integrated sim for all sorts of reasons again you've got a smaller footprint with that uh, and then you've also got the security and the standards which are all being maintained uh, without that place this is a gsma standard um and then you have as i said before you have versions which are iuicc which basically means it's single profile or it can be remotely uh, provisioned around that. This is my domain in terms of ecosystem development. This technology is currently available. We're going to market with organizations like Sony Altair, and a lot of 70% of the sort of market share on um, uh, module vendors. It's available for Murata, Quetel, Circom, Sierra, Telet. This technology is available on, on evaluation kits uh, so that people can start to, to try this technology out. But it's a huge game changer. And actually, that's why ARM acquired Simility and released us back out to the market. We are the disruptor in the space to advance this technology. So we're very, very keen for people to come in and bring us with those and ask us questions and get involved with us and make this technology more freely available to, to folks um, who, are, who are joining this call. Now, one, one of the points you touched on there that I wanted to expand upon was that topic of, of power consumption. Now, um, I mean, when we... when when we're discussing IoT applications, in many cases, they're going to be battery powered. Um, and when I sort of either select an eSIM as my technology or iSIM as my technology, how much understanding do I get from a supplier like yourself about the power consumption of, of that element? Um, you know, do, do SIMs consume much power? Do they have a big impact on battery life? And do you sort of provide any sort of a use case profile for a, a power profile for a SIM? Uh, good, good question. So we're we're part of the jigsaw. Um, I think think about this as a holistic way of approaching uh, approaching IoT design. You you know, you have elements of the sim which are around power, and there's some power saving mechanisms that you can actually put in place. You have an operating system inside the sim that can execute some of those. But also, you need to look at the underlying, particularly for integrated sim or, or for your e sims. You need to look at the underlying. Uh, technologies that come within the silicon that's being provided inside that device. So the device maker, not the device, sorry, pardon me, the, the chip maker, the uh, silicon maker will be designing their uh, product to be absolutely optimized for certain and different conditions. So for example, Sony have an Altair 1250 today. 
they're bringing out their 1350 next year. Uh, and the power optimizations that are enhancing that have been, uh, from what we understand, are very, very positive and very aggressive in how they're trying to improve the power. Efficiency. So you have to look at it when you're doing design and going, what's my silica? Now, you want to find out from your silicon vendor what my choices are on one power consumption. You also want to have that related to the module vendor about their view on how they're uh, enhancing power consumption within the, within the actual device. Uh, and then you've also got the capability within those uh, devices that are being uh, uh, produced, the modules and the silicon, is that they will also have some technologies that are capable that networks are saying they're capable. So a couple of those examples are um, uh, power saving mode. And that's essentially for MBOT and CATAM for constrained devices. And it's a sleep mode. Simply, you can turn it off, go to sleep. Device, you can imagine a water meter doesn't want to report all the time. It wants to be in the field a long time to conserve the battery, it wants to wake up every two months, every month, whatever the cadence needs to be. So you have those power saving modes. Now the networks enable you to have those power saving modes. The device will have those capabilities and the operating system is kind of the interface that goes, go into suspend and resume, go to sleep, wake up. So it does the execution piece on that side. So you wanna make sure if you're designing a device that the operator you wanna work with also has that capability for something like power saving. And there's other terminology such as EDRX, which is much more sort of consumer based. It's about how they manage the power. So the, the piece is we're not going to give you all of the answers. We can help you on the sim, but it's about ecosystem and bringing that ecosystem together for device designers to be able to make more informed choices. And there's some fantastic resources in all sorts of places. Nordic is fantastic. We're working with them on integrated sim. They've got some great resources about the terminology and how to put those pieces together. So I can't give you a single answer of the point. It's always going to be a combination. And that's why you need to engage with ecosystem partners to help you find that answer, because that answer will be there through the communities that, that we certainly engage with, for sure. I'd just like to, if I can, and I don't know if, if you have the answer to this, but sort of dig down on that that uh, discussion of the PowerPoint and also uh, power, yeah, the power profile, but also on on the the SIM and the operating system. So the way you describe it, it makes it sound like the the SIM and the operating system in the SIM is responsible for sort of controlling the radio transceiver, my radio modem, and my my microcontroller, which is implementing my IoT application has to communicate through the SIM or to the SIM, or is it a combination of talking to the SIM and also talking to the radio modem um, when, when you're building the application? And if, if so, is, is there some sort of standardized API uh, to talk to the SIM, to, to inquire and, and ask it to do certain things? Yeah, you. I mean, everything is a combination factor in those pieces. And, you know, I'm on the business development side. I can certainly uh, bring one of our colleagues on a deeper technical knowledge. But essentially, the operating system is a link point within the, the, the SIM technologies. That's the key point here. It does a lot of the sort of interface through in different scenarios for different uh, hardware and, and different software solutions, depending on the application. Um, it's a great question uh, that perhaps I can come back and, and give you a more detailed answer or point you to, to folks that can give you that more specific answer. Yeah, so uh, hold my hands up for that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Just uh, uh, it was uh, an, an interesting because the way you're describing it was is uh, sort of trying to visualize in my head the block diagram of how yeah. that was going to fit together. Now, when we come to um, a company, they've decided to to build an IoT based application. Let's take something uh, which is popular at the minute, which are electric vehicle chargers. There, there's a lot of uh, rollout of those at the minute using uh, IoT cellular I IoT to um, monitor them, control them. Uh, check what uh, status and, and handle billing and things like that. When I've um, I've, I've chosen my my SIM technology, um, obviously the, the the SIM has to be pre-programmed with some sort of certificate or some sort of authentication information in order that it can connect to the network and and remote provisioning can happen at all. So um, you know, uh, do 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 the, the the certificates get programmed into the device? before I receive them? Or is that something that I have to do with a secure programming partner during manufacturing? Where, where does that sort of happen? Yeah, no, good, 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 good question. So from, from a perspective of integrated SIM, I'll try and summarize it. You, you, you now have to deal in a virtual scenario here rather than everything happening in one uh, particular location. But essentially an integrated SIM, you'll have, uh, you know, on the one hand, you've actually got your, your chip, 
and that's manufactured by the chip vendor, uh, by the silicon plant that you actually have. And what they do is they develop it and then they associate uh, through root, root of trust keys on that chip. So you have a root of trust key to get to that chip and that they know each other. And that happens and it has to happen in a secure environment to be GSMA certified. Um, so that happens on the one side. And then on the other side, what we have to do in integrated SIM is we have to make sure there's a bond between the profile information and the chip. This is the big thing. You've got to make sure that actually um, the right profile is going on the right chip and that unique bond is actually made between those two parts. And that's where an organization like Keegan steps in where we have a and that has to happen in a secure environment. And what happens there is that Keegan takes that in a secure environment. Again, GSMA certified. And we bring the profile together, we bring the chip ID, we bring the root of trust keys, and we bring those together with all the other dynamic data that's required for that particular profile or the applet, et cetera. And we bring that together in a thing called a blob. It is a true statement. It is called a blob. It's a binary large object. Now, once that's developed in a secure unit, that can actually be loaded, effectively loaded onto the device in an unsecure environment. So what that means is that Keegan takes away all that pain with the silicon partner for the, the, the company that's looking to end the enterprise. They want to order 100,000 blobs with X uh, profile on them. We can generate the blob, gets delivered to the ODM or the contract manufacturer who's making it and can be loaded, or it could be loaded in different stages. It could be loaded at the module maker's site, or it could be loaded at the ODM site. So the the sweet thing is it can be done in an unsecure location. Right. Now, um, again, just coming back to the point of the, those iSIMs, this is this is an integrated SIM. This is this is designed to be sort of integrated uh, with other silicon devices. Does Keegan provide that as like an IP block that um, like sort of VHDL or something that I might integrate with a chip I'm designing? Or is it um, a, a, a silicon chip which I need to put in the package next to my microcontroller or, or whatever device. I yeah, you're licensing. To. Good question, actually. So you're licensing. I don't want to get into other people's licensing model, but essentially you're uh, the module vendor in this in this in the scenario of taking, you know, want to take a module. They're buying the hardware. They're buying the IP and whatever is required to enable their ISIM technology, that ISIM technology to work in that particular module. What Keegan's doing is it's providing the operating system and the blob and that service part of the process. We're not uh, providing IP in that sense. So this is the shift. It's actually the SIM is going into the silicon, and then that's allowing an enterprise to decide what they're buying from a module vendor who's then buying the IP effectively from uh, from the silicon partner. But you also have the slightly added for for folks that perhaps aren't so close to the sort of silicon market is that you will also have organizations that are developing the whole piece. They're effectively the module designer and the silicon manager, and they're producing the whole module themselves. And with different models of that, so Sony Altair make the chipset, then uh, Mirage or Crectel take that chipset and they make their own modules. Uh, so, someone uh, like Sequence, who are coming to market, a good partner of Keegan's, they're actually developing all of the technology and selling the module. So, uh, so, so then they're, they're actually taking their own IP and then selling that product on. I hope that answers your question without us. Yeah, yeah. IP vendor, we're not, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's super. It's, it's great to understand sort of who, who's doing what in the chain because obviously, as a, I think where engineers struggle a lot is, you know, the, the uh, their employer decides they're going to start making an IoT cellular application. And then it's sort of like all hands to the pump, right? <laughs> what does that mean? What are the implications? And where do I, I go for information? And that's uh, that's why we have you on the show to to try and understand and break all of that down and, and, yeah, the, uh, and get the details. Sorry, I was going to say the most important element is bringing your ecosystem together. If you someone's coming to you in a hardware team and saying, you're going to make a device for me in isolation to which operator you're working with, you need to check, you know, the challenging that bringing those pieces together. That's fundamentally important because you have to test these things all the way through the networks, yeah. you know, and you have to find out if what actually an organization saying is capable, is fully tested, if it's operational or if it's being tested or if it's being rolled out for your particular use case. So, uh, yeah. yeah, just share information and ask for other partners to come together is, is my sort of guidance on that. So, obviously, you, you've highlighted the, the, um, the, provision of this operating system for sims i mean um how 
how should we understand that we have real-time operating systems for embedded systems? We have obviously an operating system like Linux or Windows for our, our PCs. How, how should I understand an operating system for a SIM? Um, what's it contain? What can it do? And, and as, a, as a, an application developer, can I put things on there or get it to do some extra things for me, maybe to offload um, some tasks from my microcontroller application, for example? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I think at the beginning, just touching on that, you have different flavors of operating system, depending on whether it's M to M or if it's consumer. So, you know, essentially it can support, it's there to support, you know, Java or native applets. So, you know, you're trying to put a device into the field, you're trying to work out which operator you want to work with, and you want to have a multi imz which is a, a solution based uh, on an IUIC solution where you're actually uh, wanting to move from one operator to another operator, and you design the applet, the operating system will assist in in execution of that particular applet. You may want to do a, a you know IMEI tracking of a device. Uh, you may want to lock to one device that's required, and you don't want to move anything off that particular device. So there's a variety of activities that the operating system can actually execute, um, depending on the use case uh, of, of what the organisation is trying to do. And, and another sort of additional question around that is um, obviously we have remote provisioning, which allows you to obviously set up who your um, network network partners are that you want to be able to connect to um, on a cellular basis, cellular, through the cellular base stations. Are, are you also able to update the OS or add additional Java applets wirelessly as well? Or is it really important to know what you want in t on that SIM in the OS when you actually uh, define your application no no things can be updated i mean that's the point you you have that capability to do that but you know there's there's always going to be elements you want to do but obviously a designing right from the outset is one of the key elements you know you, you can't future proof but but essentially yes you're you're able to do that of course now, one of the big challenges that the industry has generally in, in all these connected applications is security. Um, it's a key ingredient, and uh, so many people seem to get it wrong and, and make mistakes. But um, when we look at GSM and LTE as technologies, they've over the years, they've proven themselves to be uh, quite robust and, and, and secure from themselves. Um, I understood from looking at the website, you have a technology called IoT Safe. Um, and, and there's lots of you know, other useful information about, um, about potential security challenges. Could you take us through some of those and, and explain um, what IoT Safe does to help? Yeah, sure. I mean, if, I, th I think we've got another slide on this, um, if that's okay. It might just help folks. But um, so first and foremost, let's just define um, two, two things. One, we call this uh, Open IoT Safe. This was, I think, 2019, where... Um, through the G it's a GSMA led initiative, and effectively they brought together, you know, uh, chip makers, module makers, device makers, MVNOs, OEMs, and cloud providers to see how they could bring into one flow a sort of an end to end security. This end to end security of data chipped to cloud is sort of a, a, a drive that's been wanted in place. And one of the key elements, really, of, uh, of us being a, a lead partner in this technology is that. You've already got through the uh, tamper resistant element, the 3GPP uh, network uh, tamper resistant element, which is your SIM, you've got a very robust, uh, secure enclave. Um, and that's there to protect the radio. And what enterprises want, 98% of enterprises surveyed wanted, they want end to end security from a device to the cloud. And what we have to do is think about where an enterprise thinks, thinks of themselves. They think of their IoT devices, these nodes that are out there as an extension of their business. Okay. This is an extension of their network. So they want, well, they're, in all those, they're all over the world. They want to make sure their devices can communicate back. And really, the essence of what was uh, uh, foundational around IoT Safe is actually how we can leverage. Uh, and the security side, i.e. the tamper-resistant element inside the SIM, to allow that end-to-end -end security to happen. Because at the moment, what actually happens is uh, the enterprises have to invest in a separate secure enclave to protect their keys. So the concept is, and it's now been delivered through, is the keys are sitting on the SIM side for the enterprise. And then that allows them to make a connection from their device securely through those keys through the TLS or the DTLS layer to the uh, fundamentally the uh, enterprises account API. 
And once you've got that connection in place, and that's all securely done from these devices to the cloud, then what that also allows you to sort of expand on is then you can start to get multiple devices connecting to each other uh, to allow these secure um, uh, transactions to take place. So, for example, uh, you'll have your motor vehicle, you're going to, I don't know, through a toll or you're going to plug into an EV charger. What it then starts to enable is these machine to machine transactions happening because the keys, the private keys are being uh, exchanged and authenticated between those two devices. And we call that and that whole drive around that is around the economy of things. And this this is exponential without human beings having to be involved in that. Bridge. So it's about security end to end for the uh, enterprises and allowing uh, multi-directional um, uh, uh, machine to machine transactions to take place. And there's a number of ways. In that, and I think Jim is, you know, explained a little bit further about how he's taken IoT safe and what they're looking to do on top of that. But it's a very, very interesting initiative. We're making great headway with it. Um, but it's an open uh, project led by the GSMA, of which Keen are, are, are a lead partner. And again, delighted if people want to come back to us and find out more. Yeah. I, th I think it's fascinating. There's just so many ele elements to this. Um, you know, I, I think uh, over the years, you, you get the feeling that sort of cellular there is there. It, it works. It's very clear and, and it functions all the time. But um, you've really helped to sort of guide us to all, all of the different challenges and all the elements that, that pull, you have to pull in uh, together to to bring these uh, IoT uh, devices to market and and the role that the sim plays is is uh, exceptionally important yeah i don't think um many people have had a grasp of how complex uh sim technology is and and uh, the you know the security challenges that large organizations are facing and, and how they want to solve them so thanks very much for all, all of that uh, all of those insights we'll come back to you again shortly so uh hang in there i'm just going to um, do a quick giveaway for our um our viewers and uh, we'll bring you back in for the round table towards the end of the show. Thank you. So it's giveaway time. Previously, we gave away five USB sticks packed with over 3,500 of the best circuits Elector has ever published. Congratulations to Vincent Gregors, Wojciech, Mark, and Theo. Your USB sticks should have already arrived. And to extend our thanks to you as loyal Engineering Insights viewers, for this episode, I have five eBooks from the Elector Library. We've selected Programming Voice Controlled IoT Applications with Alexa and Raspberry Pi, which is written by Dr. John Allwork. It's split into two parts, starting by covering Alexa skills before going on to show how IoT devices based upon the Raspberry Pi are designed. For your chance to win, simply visit the link shown below and enter the keyword berries. That's the keyword berries with your entry. And we wish you the best of luck. So let's go back to Jimmy from Zariot. Hi, Jimmy. Hopefully you're still there. Yep, I'm here. So just to let our audience know, Jimmy's on his way to the Things Network conference in Amsterdam and is at the airport. And unfortunately, they've closed the business lounge. Um, so he's had to find the next best position, um, which is where he is now. So <coughs> thanks for hanging in there and making uh, making time to, to join us still. So before, um, yes, yeah, so the, the first question I was going to then ask about here was, what has it been in, like in the past before yourselves and companies like uh, Keegan were on the market to bring a large quantity of IoT devices to market? W was everyone running around trying to plug SIM cards into everything they were building? Yeah, I, mean, I think the first thing we learned was uh, how diverse it is. I, I come from a long telecoms background and uh, the last 25 years before we really started to see uh, IoT explode. Uh, there was really only three solutions. You run, you run your wife, you text your mother, or you surf your emails. Well, that gets completely blown out of the water. The diversity of solutions means that we need a diversity of expertise. And, and that's exactly why we want to work with people like Keegan. Um, Toby mentioned on a number of occasions that uh, we need to work as an ecosystem and like share information. That's, that's absolutely true. It's, it's driven the way that we've started to go to market. We, we, we've looked to be able to 
uh, work with more partners and be able to try and bring it together and, and make the telecoms network an integral part of the solution. Um, take the uh, basically take the telecoms blinkers off and maybe listen a bit more to the market needs. Um, and I, I, I think there's a lot we can do. The enterprise actually knew everything that's possible uh, within cellular networks. I think we can take a much larger part because they'll be able to utilize those a lot more. I've heard uh, Toby mentioned a couple of the different features that you can do on the SIM. We have, we have a number of those which we want to mention and, and a number more. And I think if telecoms could be less opaque, uh, we can really start to join the party. All those problems of people running around, we'll be able to hopefully make those a little bit more sensible and make, you know, make things a little bit more easy. So let's uh, roll it back. If, if I'm trying to build a cellular IoT platform, what are the things that I need to be considering in order to firstly develop my IoT device, whatever it might be, and then move from, from having a, a design to manufacturing it and actually rolling out and deploying it? To my customers. Yeah, so I, I think not just mentioned diversity, but I think everything can boil down to three elements. You've got the device, you've got the network, you've got the application. So that's your that's your DNA. If you understand the DNA of your uh, solution, then, then you're on the right track, um, because that allows you to make educated decisions and effectively build out the uh, solution, but also. Uh, secure, secure the solution because you, you can build in that uh, security um, by design, which is, is something we all want to, to move uh, towards. What we did find, and it's changing a little bit now, but what, what we did find at the beginning was speed to market was essential. So people were taking off the shelf uh, solutions, which is a bad thing, but just keeping on top of what you've actually bought what's actually in there. And the other point was, I think we're taking maybe testing the boards a little bit to see if the solution actually is easily able to create a fully uh, hardened or fully um, developed solution and they take something. If the market's there, then we'll, we'll work with that. But if somebody suddenly says, I'll have 10,000 of them, then you're actually no longer testing the water, you're now in, in the uh, deep. So what we think we need to do is we need to make the telecoms work better because with that element in the middle, with, with, we're speaking to the device, we're speaking to the application. If we can give visibility and maybe start to walk together those two ends, then you can move away from Frankenstein's IoT and build something that's a little bit more um, conducive. As we've said before, people will be aware of SIMs for, for handsets. Um, in, in the IoT space, you basically have two choices. You have LTE M or you have NB IoT, which is narrowband IoT as, as the, the sort of two options. Um, is there any difference in the way I'm going to be handling my SIM for those two types of um, cellular IoT technology compared to a, to a smartphone? Yeah, there, there is. Um, so first thing to remember is there's, there's regional differences. So some regions only support narrowband IoT. Um, South Africa, for instance, um, uh, India, Pakistan, they're both narrowband IoT only. Uh, and then there's a much smaller number that only support LTEM. So that's mainly Central America. Uh, and then there's an area in the middle uh, that supports neither. So, and even in the area, in the countries where there, there is both uh, narrowband IoT and LTE, like the UK, you find that certain carriers are support one, and certain carriers support the other. So you need to be very careful with that because that can create a element where the deployment can be a little bit flat. Um, with MVNOs, with us, uh, we will try and use multiple operators, but the thing people we find is that searching for network, that's the, that's the horror story, that's the horror thing that really kills the, kills the battery. So you need to bear that in mind. So we've always suggested previously uh, that you should have a backup of, of um, older generations, so 2G, 3G. But even that strategy is now becoming uh, more difficult because you have some setting of two, 2G and 3G networks. Uh, the US is already near enough done. Um, some areas are uh, have a lot different schedules. The UK doesn't end its 2G support till 
2033, I think, Ola is something similar to 2030. Um, but that's not all going to be done on the same day. Uh, you're gradually going to find that that backup solution uh, gets, gets less and more, gets more patchy. Um, the good news is when that happens, the bandwidth will become available when they're about IT and LCM. So they should be improving. So it, it, it is a flaw. It's not all, it's not all uh, bad. And you also need to make sure that when you're speaking to an operator, you get those roaming agreements in place and get a guarantee of coverage. Um, there is a, some reciprocal uh, agreements that normally work with mobile phones that sometimes are less, less reciprocal. That's, that's a word. Um, when it comes to narrowband IoT in particular, but also LTE. Yeah. Now, um, obviously, there's, there's those two types of technologies, LTM and, and narrowband IoT. Uh, if, as a developer, if I'm tackling IoT, cellular IoT for the first time, um, what would lead, if I have the choice, like in the UK, where I can have, I have the choice of, of both technologies through the cellular network that's there, um, when should I be choosing LTEM and, and when does narrowband IoT make more sense? Is it, is it more than just about bandwidth? Uh, yeah, so, so both support um, sort of the lower end data rates. Uh, and Toby's already described, you can increase the battery life by sleeping a lot. Um, and they both have better coverage than, for instance, 4G. Um, and they're both excellent choices for two and three G uh, placements in the position where you really have a good field. Um, so the battery life is increased by reducing the radio traffic between the device and the network. Uh, they sleep. So, narrowband sleeps more than LTM. So if you, need, if you have a service that's um, maybe screwed on the side of a building that's been there for 10 years, narrowband IoT is great. But it's a balance because if you have a, um, a truck, then actually you really need to um, interact a little bit more. And that's when you start to look at LTM. It's more likely to be awake, so you're more likely to be able to update and give yourself networks access to it and respond. Um, LTE also provides more bandwidth, so it's better for those slightly larger uh, solutions. So things where you need to do um, firmware updates or, or like control something, uh, you can even put voice on uh, LTE. Um, and Mark, I would mention one more. There's 5G red caps, so 5G reduced capacity. So that's a third option. It's it's not as widely deployed. Uh, I did see somewhere that uh, it was being run at Malaysia with Ericsson uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but that's designed more yeah. for wearables and sort of a complex industrial solution. It fills that gap between LTM and the full heavy 5G with the enhanced uh, mobile broadband. So it's, it's, it's just in that little, little area between full 5G and, and LTM. I think it's medical, something like that. I think uh, that might be something that you should also bear in mind if you've got a little bit more time to go to market. So, as you said, the, the um, it's quite a complicated landscape. Um, as you said, even in a country like the UK or some countries in Europe where both narrowband IoT and LTM are there and available, you might not, say, for example, get both of them from Vodafone or Deutsche Telekom or whoever else is providing the network. So, so what do I do as a as as a as a company yeah. wanting to so roll out I, IoT devices, how do I find a partner? And when I found somebody, how are they going to charge me for the service? And am I being charged with like a, a standing fee for connecting to the um, to the network? And then I pay for data on top, or, or sort of how does the billing work? It's ten thousand per day. You hit the nail on the head. You need to find a partner. You need to find somebody you can work with. This is a long term commitment. If you're going to put uh, IoT in the ground, it's going to be there. Considerable amount of time, and it could be somewhere very remote. So you don't be uh, creating truck rolls to go and fix something or go and change a sim yeah, because yeah. that will get rid of any advantage yeah. you have yeah. from the price you have elsewhere. But obviously, price is important, um, but equally, you need to be able to, to work with them. Um, you also need to uh, be able to secure about the coverage. So if you can get multiple uh, operators in the region and then you're moving a lot, that's great. You may want to use an MVNO in certain circumstances, but maybe an MVNO where it gives you multiple operators is another uh, option. Um, the price can be done. I, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, companies need to be more 
technically flexible and I think to support technical flexibility you also need some commercial flexibility as well um, you, on most occasions we will create a bundle uh, that, that is expected for that um, Okay, that'd that be a of sim. Okay. Uh, and then we will create that bundle, and okay. that would be okay. the most efficient way of buying it. What you do need to be careful of, though, is that you want the bundles as tight as you possibly can because you don't want to be paying me, for instance, for two megabit and you only ever use one. And that's, that's stupid, you've got twice as much as you need. Why, the reason people do that is because if you go over your bundles, you can sometimes see quite high charges, almost cumulative charges is to go beyond your bundle. So what we try and do and what we're seeing a little bit more with the net in, um, in the industry is, is a pooling of the data. We, we pool all the data so you have got a thousand devices uh, all with one megabit and uh, they're all using uh, underneath the uh, uh, bundle limit but one of them goes crazy because it, it just goes in a continuous boot loop or something. If you're if you're uh, pulling that across the um, state, and it doesn't really affect you. So that, that's one of the things you need to do. You need to look at it and actually make sure that the commercial offering is as appropriate as the technical offering. And I think, particularly for uh, smaller MVNOs, we could be a little bit more flexible. It's hard with big players like that. But I think everybody is coming to that conclusion. We need to work with the market. One of the um, interesting aspects of, of IoT is, is the same as, as with our, our smartphone handsets, the fact that we can roam from one country to another. Um, do these uh, LTEM and narrowband IoT modules support roaming? And on that topic as well, if, if I'm deploying a device which is, say, on the, the Swiss, um, on the Swiss French border or on the, the, the Belgium Dutch border, are there problems then or risks of, of being charged a huge amount of money for being uh, for roaming, even though the device is actually uh, within the country that it's supposed to be in? Yes, yeah, so we're an MVNO, so essentially everything's roaming up on networks. The, the MNOs own the uh, the most technical operators are virtually They own the, the actual cell towers. We, we utilize those. We have the reasons to, to utilize them in a, um, in a respective way. Um, what you will find is, um, particularly with MDNOs, it's a little bit easier for us because um, we, we're not really tied to our network. We, we, if you have a treat, we may be using Vodafone and E and 3 in the UK. What we do actually. Um, to try and pick the, the best uh, and what we would do is to cover that those problems with our maybe Luxembourg, where you may get uh, France or Germany, we would create a thing with the price. To be honest, the EU is much of the muchness when it comes to prices. There's outliers like uh, Co or Angela, for instance, just the price of the system. If you have that issue and you feel that that might be an issue, then you can negotiate that. And the other thing is we, we have a steering solutions within our uh, within our own um, network. So we can ensure that you don't go into, if there's, if there's three carriers in a country and two of them are $1 and the other one is $20, we can make sure that you never go up to $20. Um, so we can, we can control that. We're also actually, Again, going back to Toby's point, there's, there's app that we can put on to see if we could actually give you the opportunity to um, pick that Roman car uh, as the enterprise we wanted to. Uh, we've got a partner we're announcing next week, uh, Rave Device. I just realised I've announced it this week. Um, but uh, they have a, an option, and one of the solutions they're putting in uh, with us is the option to be able to open that up. So there's things you can do, but in Europe, this makes much of a problem as long as you're not trying to go to Monaco. So, um, just we're, we're running out of, of time. Unfortunately, this is so exciting and fascinating to, to f get so much detail from experts all, all in one place for, for a change on this particular topic because it is really hard to research uh, from the desk. Um, so, uh, coming back to what we were talking about with Toby is security. It's a, it's a massive discussion point for anyone who's, who's you know, using some sort of cloud-based or cloud-linked services. How is security then implemented in cellular IoT and, and what are the typical weaknesses that people need to be aware of, um, typical risk points? So, you're right. 
for uh, IoT to be a success, it has to be secure. It has to be trusted. Um, because IoT, especially when it's coupled with AI, I think that's been probably the biggest impact of our lives uh, in, our, in our general lives that we'll see. Um, to be honest, I, I think it's not going to be long where selling an IoT device with poor cyber security will be like selling a car without seatbelts. Just won't be accepted, and we can see that that's being recognised by administrations across the globe. And it's going to be uh, a buy-in decision. So the US cyber security mark uh, comes in during Biden's administration of pushing that to next year, I think. Uh, but that will allow consumers to make the decision uh, on on a buying a device by a, by seeing how much commitment that vendor has made to security. And that's backed by some of the massive major players: Google, the FCC, um, Samsung. Um, so that's that's a carrot. But we're also seeing a stick. So, for instance, the UK has the PSDI uh, bill, product security, telecom infrastructure bill. We should get that one. Um, and the EU has the radio equipment directive. Uh, they're all legally binding, um, um, legally binding rules that you need to apply to. They all work around it. So they can, Okay, we get some three, three, six, five. We've got a nice, we try and simplify our website. But if you look at that, you look at things like resources, the IoT Security Foundation, uh, you'll, you'll be in I mean, Sally is already in good shape because it's license spectrum and, and things like that. And IoT Safe and uh, some of the solutions we bring give those tangible benefits. But uh, yes, yeah, speak, speak to the people who know because that's a that is a real uh, onion. I could be here for another hour and a half on that one. <laughs> Super. Thanks very much. Just bringing in uh, Toby again there. Welcome back, Toby. Hi. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, like I say, it's, it's, uh, I think the onion description is, is, a, is a good um, a good one because obviously the more that we are working through this these discussion points and these questions, the more and more we're finding out and, and it's leading to more, more questions. Um, so at this point as well, what I wanted to ask was um, to, to you, Toby, um, when, when I look around on the internet for this stuff, like I said, it's very difficult to find any sort of firm information. Um, do you have a way for customers to try out eSIMs and iSIMs and cellular IoT? Uh, yeah, no, good good question. I said a couple of things from Keegan's side is we do have a bunch of very good resources. And I think, Stuart, what I'll do is I'll send you some of those directly to you and you can share them with the community, just brochures on explaining terminology you know, we've, we've got some resources we can share, but we're also uh, launching uh, uh, later on this year the sort of particularly focused around integrated SIM, the, uh, the integrated SIM evaluation kit program. And that's where we're bringing our partners together, module vendors who sell evaluation kits like Maratha and Quetel and Sierra uh, 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 and Circom, et cetera. We're bringing those to make those evaluation kits more available to the ecosystem. That's one of our key goals. How can more people get hold of technology and try those those technologies fundamental to that is us partnering with organizations like jimmy's on the connectivity side to make sure that we can help get customers evaluating testing faster better simpler uh at keegan's an enabler we're right at the bottom we're enabling a lot of people to do a lot of things and we're supporting uh, those elements within the ecosystem and then i think as jimmy was saying you know ecosystem is so important so you know connect with us as individuals, connect with us as organizations, and we'll always be happy to find the right person in the ecosystem to pass you on to. It's like pass the parcel when it's passing the person around because someone will have the answer, you just got to find them in that way. But we've, we've got some initiatives that we can help with, definitely. And, and Jimmy, is is that the same for, for you and Zariot that, you know, if, if I wanted to sort of experience or explore, have a demo of, of what you offer in the area of uh, cellular IoT, is there something you can show me as well? Or, or do I already need a partner like Keegan and, um, and other elements of, of my planned device already already available? Oh, you can come to us. So uh, we, Keegan, we will provide a decision to Keegan. Right, to you, the profiles, so you can expand some of the uh, functionality and that's it. We always want to hit the people because uh, we absolutely a technology company and we absolutely do want to make that, we do want to make the network um, more accessible. They want to be able to bring it in and create the sort of data solution. We create an
we want to be able to say this is the guy who can help you with uh, end to end encryption, this is the guy who can help you with blockchain. That both partners be completely open, honest, and show you who they are. We don't try to hide it, don't introduce it to them. But then we also want to be able to say this guy can help you test. We've got a company from Sellership here who do testing and they've got a type of certification people as well. So potentially we can with another connectivity we can introduce you to these people who can work with key images different and we can actually enable you all the way through to hopefully get that white mark to say watch your IoT widget, whatever it is. Um, available to make you a success. Super. Uh, Toby, um, what sort of uh, IoT applications are you seeing having sort of like the most traction at, at the moment? I, I mentioned EV chargers, which was was one I found on on um, on the website looking around. Um, which, what sort of uh, areas of cellular IoT really get uh, strong? Uh, well, from my perspective, I think you know, from an eSIM and an iSIM perspective, what we're seeing particularly around innovation around uh, logistics and devices that are moving around a lot of these merges you know it can be a label could be design of a, a product that's smaller that can then be uh, taken to market and that applies for iSIM or, or for embedded SIM because you have a, a SIM that's smaller so we're driving those the other area interesting enough which is really driving very hard I think is is around smart meters smart infrastructure um, you know you've got examples there of like a water meter that doesn't have battery power wants to be put into the field for 10 years, how's it going to do that? Or those are the pieces we're actually seeing then. And don't want to get vendor lock in, in in that essence of I have to be mandated that I can move to somebody else because it's a it's a government contract, essentially. Uh, uh, certainly within the EV charging market, uh, we're seeing that growth. And then also within healthcare, I mean, we're seeing it on the innovation. Suddenly, this technology is allowing existing types of product to be uh, brought to market, but equally what it's allowing is new product design and that's bringing new business value and that's bringing new business case, bringing the cost down, all these things are coming together. Uh, and I think the essence of what we said is, is, is all that that's driving, it's about how you can start the prototyping, how you can work with, you know, organizations like Jimmy's on innovation on the, uh, you know, the, the, the pieces of the puzzle that need to be put together it is critically important at the moment. But yeah, logistics, Healthcare, smart meter, big areas for us at the moment that we're seeing uh, that drive in it. Yeah, uh, Jimmy, I'm just going to come back to you. Um, one fi final question for you because the, the the audio is very uh, challenging at times to to get through. But one of the things you just mentioned was about the blockchain, and you have a, a blockchain partner. What role does blockchain play in a cellular I I IoT application, and where is it used? Cellular is more in favor of blockchain. So blockchain is hugely uh, secure. Um, it's not so everything comes down to attestation. So what we do is we piggyback on all of the uh, security that Toby was talking about with IoT safety. We utilize the uh, secure, non volatile area of IoT safety device, but we use it for other things as well. Um, what the blockchain company does come to the smart hands. Um, they, at the end of their manufacturing process, the device comes on, they check it works, but at the same time, they um, use an API into our networks and we write a um, token for that device and that SIM uh, onto the secure of the SIM, some pre the SIM for, for them. And then they box that up and it lives on a shelf for six months. Um, but when it gets sold, um, they, and comes back on board, they know who they're going to sell that to. So they, they trust the attestation because it was done on the manufacturing, and then they add another token that says, this is a label and, and able to access Jimmy Jones' ledger. Uh, so what we're actually doing is cellular is then working with blockchain to be able to create a true end to end solution, just to totally started with. It, it works it through manufacture, through sale, through the delivery, and then we utilize and give it back on a, a, a secure solution for blockchain to be able to give the customer actually the um, peace of mind and the security they need to be Super. Thanks very much for that. Um, one last question then to, to Toby. Um, 5G is on the horizon, 6G is already being developed in the background there. Um, but one, one of the interesting things about 5G is that we can create private networks. And if I understood and read correctly, that some people have actually had 4G private networks in, in the past. Are, are you seeing these being deployed at the moment? Um, does the 
private networks um what benefits do they do they give to people do they really give you sort of a bit more control over the infrastructure for your cellular iot application well i think i mean with 5g private networks the clue is in the title it's about control and it's about creating an environment it could be a, a footprint um you know of a certain size certain scope uh, i think from our size we see opportunity in there and, and i think jim is probably going to have a you know a clearer view on it from his perspective because from our perspective, from my perspective in ISIM, it's all about the scalability of the devices. We're looking for scale on those devices. Can private networks give us that scale to drive innovation on products? And maybe 5G don't from, from, a, from, a, from an ISIM perspective. It, you know, they can take that technology. Uh, but yes, we, we, we see the growth in that deployment because we're seeing the demand for it as well. You know, organizations want to have certain sites that are controlled in a certain way for, for, for control over those. Um, whether it scales for us, we we shall see. We shall see. I'm, uh, I'm 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 less knowledgeable in that particular realm. I'm focused on lots of small, very large volume devices at the moment, so <laughs> consuming as well. So. Fantastic. So and thank you. Can... Yeah, thank you ever so much. Uh, we've run out of time, so uh, to say thank you to you, Toby. Thank you to Jimmy as well. Um, we have to come back again, Jimmy, when it's a bit quieter in the background, tell us what uh, the Things Network was like and, and what you discovered there. It'd be interesting to find out more. No problem at all. Sorry about the bar. <laughs> no problem at all. All right. Well, thanks ever so much. And uh, yeah, I'll just wrap up the show from here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for for this episode. So what did we learn? SIMs are more than just an authentication chip. They are powerful devices that run complete applications. And while the traditional telecoms companies are mostly focused on smartphone users, there are partners like Keegan and Zariot who support the needs of cellular IoT users. Technologies like eSIMs and iSIMs allow us to ditch the plastic cards and deploy our devices with ease around the world, configuring them remotely through a process called provisioning. But like with any technology, there are many challenges from the entire ecosystem down to security. Experienced partners and these ecosystems, they understand what those challenges are and can provide solutions and help mitigate all of those risks. My thanks go out to, to today's experts, Toby Grimshaw from Keegan and Jimmy Jones from Zariot. You've delivered us with some outstanding engineering insights. So that wraps it up for today. If you'd like more of the same, we're broadcasting two episodes of Engineering Insights every month in 2023. And to keep you abreast of industry trends this year, take a look at News Bytes, our monthly 15 minute show. Please like, subscribe to Electoral TV Industry on YouTube and share our videos on whatever platforms you use. Additionally, you can also drop by the website at electormagazine.com slash EEI to see the topics for future shows and sign up for regular updates and reminders. Finally, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write me an email, drop me a line, or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining. Stay in touch. And don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions. <laughs>